crazy. Crazy. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. I'm uh, broadcasting live from frigid New York, where we're about to um, experience a uh, a bomb cyclone. I never heard of it before. Just today I heard about it. I don't even know what it is. Some type of we uh, winter type of uh, hurricane. So after all the hurricanes that we just experienced back in September, when was it? August, September, in Florida and in, uh, in Texas, Houston. So the weather is still uh, not letting up. And we've been experiencing here in the Northeast, New York, a uh, pretty cold spell for the last two few weeks. Pretty chilling my years. I think it's been more, more cold than I've ever believed for a long period of time. Now, you know that I always make fun of people who talk about the weather. So why am I talking about the weather? Uh, you know, like I said, the weather may be God created when you have nothing else to talk about. Like you go on a date, so how's the weather? You know, and you can talk about the weather for hours and say nothing. But at least you think you had a conversation. Just like Facebook, you have friends and you think you have friends when there's really no friends. I was once on an elevator going up Manhattan, it was like going to the 60th floor or something. So it's like a little ride. The elevator was packed, everyone was quiet. So I said, is no one gonna talk about the weather? So everybody like laughed, burst out laughing, because that's what you always hear in an in in elevator. You know, everyone wants to be a little cordial. Even in New York, they try to be cordial. And they say, okay, how's the weather? We're under the weather, the over the weather. It's, the rain is coming, the rain is going. There's like, so the weather is really almost a meaningless thing. But on the other hand, it's not so meaningless for the following reason. And as, as a superficial level, obviously weather can be, affect people and even devastate lives. So I'm not talking about not being empathetic and sensitive to the fact that uh, storms and serious weather conditions, whether it's, whether it's hurricanes or tornadoes or cyclones or typhoons or uh, tsunamis or earthquakes and, uh, and volcanoes, probably there's more stuff that I haven't mentioned obviously can affect, uh, dramatically affect life and death. Um, but generally speaking, the, the cycles of, uh, of the seasons, even New York has pretty extreme cycles, has very hot summers and we have cold winters. <clears throat> it's more or less manageable. Of course, people who live in the homeless, for them, again, it's dangerous. So I, again, I, want, to I want to qualify what I'm saying. But there's another aspect that, which I want to talk about, which is relevant I think, to our lives. At the end of the day, weather is one of those elements that we try to protect ourselves from. So if it's cold, you bundle up. If it's hot, you wear lighter clothing. And uh, in each situation, if it's rainy, you have an umbrella, raincoats, galoshes, boots. You know, we have all the gear necessary to deal with the brave each level of weather. You know, once upon a time, we were far more vulnerable to the elements, but we built strong homes and protect ourselves in many situations. There are obviously extreme cases, but more or less most pl civilized places have figured out how to manage the weather, extreme weathers. But there's another dimension to it, which is, we'll call it the, the mystical dimension. And uh, the one that's most relevant to us. Um, and, uh, and that is that everything in this physical world has deeper dimensions to it. In other words, when we look at the and we experience the phenomenon around us. So we use our tools, our conventional tools, are our five senses. Our five senses are sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. You see things, you hear things, you he smell them, you, uh, uh, was, it, was it the fourth one? <laughs> taste, touch, and, you taste them or you touch them. It's the only five ways we can experience the world around us. And it's actually the things that define most of our lives because these are the senses that get stimulated by the things we experience and we react to this stimulation. So it's an interesting exercise to ask yourself, uh, what is life about beyond the senses? In other words, if you were to close your ears, your eyes, your ears, your taste, touch and smell, what would you be left with? So initially the prospect if you try that experiment, initially you'd think you'd disappear because that's like so much fundament so fundamental to our uh, life experiences. But you wouldn't disappear. You know what you'd be left with? You'd be left with yourself, the naked self, stripped of our sensory experiences. 
Because remember, you don't need eyes to see yourself, and you don't need ears to hear yourself, and you don't need taste, touch, and smell to experience yourself. The senses, as some of the sages or mystics put it, are really like gates. They're gates between us and the world around us. If I cannot see, God forbid, I cannot see you. You can't see me. And the same thing with sound, to hear each other. But you don't need to see yourself to know you exist. Even though some people do check in the mirror every morning to make sure they exist. But, you know, that's more the vanity aspect of it. But you don't need any of the senses to experience yourself. So it's so fascinating that really the self, which is uh, the real you, is um, so overwhelmed and so over, I say, overshadowed by the sensory experiences of our lives. And we far more value the sensory experience than, we experience, than, the, than the self experience, which we'll call supersensory. But that's the way we live in this superficial world, where we define realities by the things that we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell which is why we are so easily distractible, easily uh, seduced, easily um, uh, so, uh, pitched to all kinds of things that are being sold to us. It's a, tr a trillion dollar industry called advertising and marketing that's really meant to do only one thing, to get your senses stimulated. And then, of course, to drive you to, um, to go to your wallet, which is maybe the sixth sense, and buy something. So in other words, it's all about stimulating something, appealing images, appealing sounds, appealing smells and tastes and touch. And there's so many subliminal forces at work. You know, today they say you go into a supermarket, you go into a store, especially the big ones. Everything has been scientifically calculated to get you to make moves. Certain colors stimulate. Blue is very soothing. Red is very threatening. And even the scent, the smell, it's all scientific to get you to make decisions. If you really want the, the most uh, extreme of that, go to a casino. And, they, uh, uh, and there, it's all calculated to keep you there as long as possible, to make you almost forget about other reality. And they use everything possible, the exact temperature and the exact sights and the sounds. Everything is calculated. So because we are susceptible and vulnerable, that doesn't mean we're doomed. It just means we are vulnerable because we're not even aware of how much of our senses are being stimulated all the time, overstimulated, which is why we get so addicted even to our gadgets, which we call the freedom of communications and uh, our mobile lives. The truth is if you shut it all off and went and lived in a forest for a week, or went on vacation and shut it all down, you'd feel a lot healthier and a lot more cleansed. Because it's like breathing fresh air. You know, you ever go to, I'm a city boy, I grew up here in New York. You know, we never see stars. You go out to the country and you only see stars in the sky. Here the bright lights don't let you see the heavens. And the same thing as so many other factors of the industrial world that doesn't let you see the natural cycles and the natural elements so this exercise was not just an exercise. My point is that there's a whole life going on beneath the surface of our senses. And I'm not knocking senses. Senses play a tremendous role. But if your life is defined by your sensory experiences, then you're living a very surface level life, a very superficial life. So senses are vital, but they have to be seen exactly as that, as the outer instruments in which we interact with the world around us. And it interacts with us. So, so what's beyond the senses? Now, I should probably announce the, non, the, 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 top, the topic of the class because all this is an introduction to that. We call it a deep freeze. Um, what are those, spiritual lessons from cold winter? Something like that. That's the idea. But I'm giving this introduction because as I said, we talked about weather, but I'm talking about a deeper dimension of it. So let me continue then. Okay, so the senses, the senses. So what's beyond the senses? Okay, that exercise is a great exercise. What are you left with? You're left with yourself. You know, what do you like when you're not being stimulated by outside stimuli? So it's a good question. Many of us are not even aware of what we're like because we're so defined by all the circumstances. We're like, basically, I don't call it victim of circumstances, but we're a product of circumstances. And even as young children, that defines a lot of our lives, what how we're stimulated, how we're not stimulated. You know. <clears throat> so
So the way the the way science puts it, and I'm beginning with science and I'll move further beyond science, physics, and then we'll go to metaphysics, and then we'll go to mystical and the spiritual. So science, what is, the, what, is, what is essentially science? It's trying to find and understand not the symptoms, but the forces that shape the symptoms of existence and phenomena. What makes this world tick? So on a very basic level, which is like almost elementary, elementary um, science, is that what we see is the outer surface of existence, like the tip of the iceberg. And beneath it, or within it, I should say, within it, you have everything is made up of elements, the elementary table. What is it, 106 elements today? I'm not even sure what number they got. The most basic element everyone knows is hydrogen, oxygen. H2O is water. Two parts hydrogen, one oxygen. What are those? What's the two? It's the molecules that make up the elements. Okay. But then beyond beneath the molecules or within the molecules are atoms. Molecules are made up of atoms. And atoms are made up of subatomic particles. And the subatomic particles are made up of sub-subatomic particles. And at where we stand today in 2018, we know many of those particles, but we also know there are many, many more. And it's just a matter of figuring them out because it's all beyond senses. Nobody has ever seen an atom. Nobody has ever seen subatomic particles they're not they're not they're no instruments even the strongest microscopes that can see them we can see better with telescopes millions of miles away out of space and we cannot see an atom that's right here that's how small it is so how do we know it exists because there's a thing called extrapolation we know it through its effects you don't always see the thing directly, but you're seeing it affecting other things, so you know there must be something there. It's like if you suddenly saw a piece of metal moving right here, and unless you think, unless you're superstitious, you probably would realize there must be a strong magnet somewhere that's exerting force that's, that's, uh, that's repelling or attracting that piece of metal. Like a black hole in a way. No one has ever seen a black hole because a black hole is defined by a gravitational pull that's so strong that it doesn't allow light to escape. So how can we see it? We don't see it. We see its effect on other bodies. So if you suddenly see, let's say, a moon or an asteroid or a meteorite you know, going on an orbit, and then suddenly you suddenly see it more erratically, it starts moving, what's causing it to be that way? So you realize there must be something there you can't see that's exerting some type of influence. So right there is a new tool that science has discovered. It's called extrapolating. You can directly See it? So you see it indirectly. It's just like, for example, in psychological terms, you see someone getting angry all the time. You know that there's something going on inside which you don't see, but from the reaction, you know there must be a cause. From the effect, you know there's a cause. From the, re from, from the reaction, you know there's some action going on. Sometimes you can discover it, sometimes you can't. So science has given us the, 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 today's common knowledge that nothing that you see is what you, you don't, is what you see is not what you get. Let's put it that way. Everything has more going on beneath it. So I remember when I wrote my book toward a meaningful life. The, the, originally, the, I, I met with a publisher, who was considered the number one expert in spiritual books in the world, and she told me, she said to me something very you know interesting. She said, I remember my agent told me, 15 minutes with her is like 15 years of experience. That's how that's how, how experienced she is. And I spent with her a good two and a half hours. So how much is that worth? I don't know, a few hundred years. Eternity. Okay, huh? Eternity. Eternity. So she said a few interesting things, but the thing I wanted to point out was she said to me, today, remember, readers and the world are comfortable with the invisible. That's a new reality. Once upon a time, people were not comfortable with the invisible. You had to prove it to them. She said, today, the invisible runs, runs our life. Electricity. Um, obviously uh, atomic energy and nuclear energy, all forms of energy, and of course computers, and now mobile and all that, all driven, the internet, it's all driven by forces that are invisible. We see its effect. You get on a phone, you can communicate, but there's no wire. So they're invisible forces, that meaning invisible to our naked eye. So the point being is 
that she says, her point was that it's much easier to explain spiritual ideas because people are comfortable with the invisible. Comfortable meaning, it doesn't mean they understand it, but it means that it's not, you don't have to, it's not a leap of faith. People can relate to it. Just I remember, it just remained with me as an interesting insight. So, so that's exactly where I'm going here and saying, okay, so what is behind these atoms and what's behind the subatomic? So I'm sure science in time will discover more particles and even more minute particles and will go, you know, how far down the rabbit hole, who knows. But it's fascinating, and this is, I'm, I always, to me, I'm always extremely um, fascinated by the parallels between scientific, especially micro quantum mechanics and microphysics with the, the spiritual and the Kabbalistic and the, and the mystical models of life because they're almost, almost similar. They're just different language. They talk exactly about the same thing, that what we see is not what you get. And behind every body, there's a soul, which is another way of saying that behind matter, there's energy. And that actually matter is energy. So long before Einstein said E equals MC squared, it was always known that matter is energy. It's just solid energy. So you see like the expression, just like for example, a piece of wood you put it in a fireplace, it turns into fuel and brings warmth. So is it wood or is it fuel for uh, energy? The answer is it's both. The wood is the outer dimension, but this piece of wood is a piece of fuel as well. And when you burn it, it doesn't disappear. It just changes form and changes into energy. And that energy never disappears. It may not be enough to warm you at some point. You need more, but it goes, where does it go? It doesn't disappear. It's, it becomes part of the, the organic reality of our lives. So bottom line is, there's, a whole, there's forces beneath the surface. And therefore, it also, and this is where science ends, and I would say metaphysics, where physics ends and metaphysics begins, and especially the spiritual side of things. Because science explains to you what makes things tick. But it doesn't tell you what it means to your life. All it does is gives us the tools that we can build technologies based on these sciences to manipulate these forces to make our lives more comfortable, which is essentially what technology is. It's manipulating the forces that shape reality to make life more comfortable, to make life more uh, efficient, maybe more profitable, however you look at it. Uh, what, the, what the mystics and the, sci the, call the spiritual science would go that what does it mean to us in other words, how do we apply it to understand ourselves in a deeper way? If who I am, when I look in the mirror, or when I experience my senses, going back to the senses, is so-and-so, is that really who I am? Or that's only my outer being shaped by the circumstances of my life? So essentially, you could say psychology, which is the study of the soul, and even deeper than psychology, entering into the unconscious and entering to the superconscious is the word I would rather use. That's the, use, the word used in Kabbalistic thought, superconscious, because it's, it's not beneath consciousness, it's above consciousness. So that superconscious is similar to the forces beneath the surface. So the conscious would be like the piece of wood. The superconscious would be like the molecules or the, or the elements, the molecules, the atoms, and you can go super, super, super conscious, all the levels, so in essence, what you're really getting is a map of your own life and a map of the cosmos and existence that's an inner map instead of the outer map. So that takes on a whole new level of interest because the physics part and the science part is fascinating, no question about it. And it's changed the world in many positive ways. But it still does not make us better people because you can be a scientist and you can know it all and you can be a miserable person and, and cause other people to be miserable. But when you understand that it's about who you are and you can learn about yourself in that deeper, deeper way, then it changes who you are and it changes the world that you look at and how you look at that world. And it has an impact in everything, starting from our personal lives and our relationships. Because if you can learn what love really means and you can learn the deeper dimensions, what makes love tick, like so to speak, the DNA or the soul and spirituality of your love, then you can not just create better technology, you can create a better loving person. And you can, you can um, juxtapose healthy love near unhealthy love. You can come to understand what, what it is 
that really defines us instead of what we think we're defined by. Because at the end of the day, anyone, every person, wants to really know well, who, I, who am I really? Am I just a product of my parents and my education and my society? Maybe I'm even a victim of that? Or is there more to me? Am I even making decisions? And what, how much control do you have over your life? I mean, there's, and these are much bigger questions and actually touch upon the essence of what makes a happy person versus an unhappy person. So when you go in this, uh, this direction, you're not just going into the, the so-called the clockwork or the technical uh, engineering that makes things tick. You're also coming to understand who you are and who the world around you is. And this, even though I guess, rather l relatively lengthy introduction is how I want to apply to the discussion that everything in this world, including the, the deep freeze and cold weather, has a soul to it. It has a deeper dimension to it. So we experience it on the outer level. Okay, it's cold, put on fur coat, bundle up, or stay at home, or whatever it is, and, and protect yourself. That's, that's on a sensory level, basic of, uh, survival. That's survival level. But what really, where does it really come from? So of course, you ask meteorologists, and weather experts and scientists, they'll tell you the weather patterns, the winds, the pressure systems, what creates a storm, Arctic, cold, and the different systems that bring it down to this part of the world. So all this becomes, uh, instead of a surface, a deeper understanding of it. So let me just give two examples before we get and discuss the actual, the cold and weather, the frost and the ice, and this, the Kabbalah of chill. Okay. A good example could be um, a very practical one. I use it very often because it's a good way to look at things. When you see someone cry, you see tears come out of their eyes. What does it tell you? They must be sad. Or maybe it's tears of joy. They must be joy. Someone will ask you, so what does sadness look like? And you'll say, I never saw sadness. But I can tell you what sadness feels like. And I can tell you how it's expressed. One of the ways is that when we're sad, and the sadness is deep enough, it, for some reason, has a psychosomatic effect and will create a buildup of liquid in our ear ducts, eye ducts, sorry, eye ducts, and tear ducts, tear ducts. <laughs> the tear ducts near our eyes, and when it, there's enough of it, it will come, cause you to cry. And I'm not getting now into exact science how that happens, that's not so relevant. So then someone will ask you, so, you know, I'm asking a very basic question. So first, does a first person cry and then they feel sad? Or first they feel sad, then they cry? And I'm not talking about crocodile tears, people who, you know, fake tears. Like the, like the joke with the, the guy, the public speaker, you know, gave, gave his rates. What does it cost to, to hire him for a talk? So he said, it depends. He gave the rates. He says, uh, $5,000 for a regular talk. If you want tears, another $1,000. If you want laughter, another thousand dollars, you know. So he has it all fabricated. Pay it, the, the, the price is white, right? He'll uh, cry through his speech. And someone will say, okay, so what do I get for $500? He says the truth, you know? Okay, so this is called the, the art of entertainment or the art of performing performance. So obviously first you feel sad and then you cry. First you feel happy and then a smile comes onto your face. You see a smile. Even little children recognize a smile, they say, they smile back. Something about the smile, is it the contour of the face? Is it a symbol of, of harmony? Whatever, you, however you explain it. Bottom line is, the outer reaction, everybody understands is a result of an inner feeling. But you can't see sadness unless someone tells you they're sad or they express it in body language or through tears. So there you have right there, the tear itself is a physical thing. Our eyes can see it. We could hear somebody cry, so our, we hear the tear, we hear the sadness. You cannot see or hear feelings, but you can sense feelings because you have feelings. That's not a sensory thing because you can't touch it and you can't hear or taste it or, 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 or see it uh, but, and touch it, right? But you can experience it. The same thing the Kabbalist would say is that when it rains outside, so most of us it rains, okay, umbrella time, raincoat, you know, it depends how serious you take the weather. 
Some people, even though it smells rain, they're already, their whole lives are overturned because who knows what's going to happen, right? You know, rain, you can melt in the rain. Um, if you listen to the weather and you see the weather, they all have the maps and they're standing there with the maps and pointing and fingers and this. I always, I always find this quite amusing, actually. Like people like to feel like they understand like what shapes the weather, you know. When they started the Weather Channel, 24-7 Weather Channel, everyone said, ridiculous, who's going to watch weather all day? And it became one of the most popular channels. My theory is because people like to, like to feel, when you, laugh, when, you, when you have no control over your life, it feels good to watch the Weather Channel, like you feel like you're really in control. The winds are coming from here, and the atmospheric pressures are from here, and the barometer is here. And then you ask somebody, what's a barometer? I don't really know. Something to do with pressure, but like, how do you, uh, temperature, okay, it's 100 degrees, 50 degrees, 10 degrees, fine. Fahrenheit, Celsius, whatever. What in Brazil, is it Fahrenheit or Celsius? Okay. Why can't the world come to peace? It's, it's like, you know, we need some, go calculate. There's a calculation for it, okay, fine. And you, but you drive on the right side, you drive the same side like here, the, the driver's on the left side. Okay, the whole auto industry, you gotta go to England, or uh, South Africa, other places, they drive on the other side. Um, they can't meet halfway, unless they put the, maybe the driver right in the middle or something. Um, so your temperature, what's barometer? So then I read what a barometer is, and I said, wow, that's amazing. Barometer is air pressure. A high barometer is higher pressure, a low barometer is lower pressure. Which means, when it's higher pressure, you always feel better. Because the pressure of the air in your skin makes your skin tighter. You know, it's like after exercise, you feel exhilarated. And low pressure makes your skin clammier, like less, less connect, attached to your, um, it's like very humid weather is, low, is always low pressure. So, so barometer is very important in the feel. It's not necessarily the, the heat or the cold, but actually a low barometer is gonna be much less comfortable than, low, than a high temperature. You have a high temperature, like hot places, but they don't have humidity. Anyway, I'm, not really relevant to the discussion, I'm just throwing it out there. So the point of the matter is, all these factors, so when it rains outside, the meteorologists will tell you the air pressure systems and this system and that system and so on. It's gonna snow, as they say, tonight, or other uh, weather, uh, weather, um, what's we saw? weather patterns. Now what would the Kabbalists say? What would the mystics say? They say, just like tears reflect on sadness, maybe rain is some form of cosmic sadness. Maybe there's some like spiritual sadness in the air. And the, and the rain is just a way for the angels to cry. And that's what we see, so we see rain. And it's not so crazy if you think about it. I'm not talking about the, the angels, but I mean to say the idea that an outer expression of something has an inner force, is everything in life is that way. So that's my introduction to be able to discuss now. Without this introduction, it would sound a little, sound a little absurd, or, or you think I'm, I'm, on, I'm on something, if I start talking about the Kabbalah, or the soul of the cold freeze. But there is a soul to it, because everything has deeper forces at work. So what is it about the cold that we can look at when we look deeper? What is the DNA, or we'll call it the microscope, the subatomic spiritual structure of a cold freeze, of, a, of chilling, brutal chilling weather. And being that, obviously we're experiencing it in this part of the world, even though there are other parts of the world where it's quite warm. I was just in Argentina a few weeks ago, and Brazilians will also tell you, there's, it's summer in the southern hemisphere. So it's interesting why you'd come here for the winter, but maybe you like winter. You know? Argentina was 93 degrees, it was boiling hot, you know? And I'm sure in Brazil it's pretty warm too now, right? Summer, even warmer. And you have Australia, of course, South Africa. Every, the southern hemisphere, it's warm. But here it's cold. I'm only saying it because wherever you are right now, if you're braving the cold weather and listening to this, or you're sitting in a sauna, and, uh, or in a bubble bath for that matter, I'm watching. I always like that uh, imagery. Um, everybody can relate to the idea of cold. You know, was it cold? You bundle up, cold morning, and you think you're all this, and you go out and they're suddenly hit by a cold burst of frozen air, a wind, and it just gets right to the, what they call, bone chilling. 
all the way into your insides. So even if you're not in that uh, region, if you're in a warm region, you're still, it's called mirror neurons. Lately, there's a new concept called mirror neurons. You've heard of this? Mirror neurons are uh, a demonstration that we're all connected. Our neurons mirror other people's neurons. And the classic example they give is if, like, God forbid you see somebody about to close a door on their fingers. They don't notice it, but let's say the car door is closing. So even if you're far away, you're going to say, ouch, because you sense and relate to the pain that they're about to experience. So the question sign, you know, is how, how, how are you feeling it? So most, most because you, it happened to you, but we mirror neurons. In other words, we can mirror another person's experience, which what we call empathy. Empathy. You empathize with someone else. So we can empathize, even if we're not in the cold winter, even if you're, in a, like I said, in a hot region, you can empathize with these feelings. So that's more or less what people describe cold. It's very, when it's really cold, now some people actually like cold more than warm, because you could always cover yourself, and, and heat you can't escape. I mean, obviously we have air conditioning and other things. But when it comes to cold, some people like it. You know, I happen to like, I'm not going to say I like cold more than heat. Each one has its own uh, pros and cons. I was born in the cold. I was born in December. Um, yeah, someone's just coming in bundled up right there. Perfect. Um, demonstration of, and, but overall, most people are not going to stay out in the cold too long. I will tell you, just as if you want to know, I, since I have a certain measure of, uh, let's call it, uh, I guess, insanity. So a few years ago, I was, uh, I was committed. I was playing tennis three times a week with a, with a, with a partner who's half my age. So he gave me a good run for the money, and I gave him a good run for the money, too. But we played three times a week, and it was out to outdoors near my neighborhood where I live. And we, you know, we, play, we just never stopped. So even in the cold winter, I remember, even it was freezing cold once, I think it was maybe 8 or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we went, and we said we're going to play. But the only problem was that the extremities got so cold, you couldn't even hold a racket. So we went back and got gloves. Gloves, a ski mask, but after five minutes, you get so warmed up because of the, this. It was really exhilarating. I really thought it was unbelievable. It's like very refreshing, just as an aside. But bottom line is, the cold has a way of unnerving us. It's very powerful. You know, it makes you uncomfortable because it's very strong. And like as I said, it's like bone chilling. They call it bone chilling for a reason, because it chills your bones. Now, the, the science behind it, which I don't want to elaborate on, is basically the human being's natural temperature is, what is it, 96 point, uh, what is it, huh? 96.7. So that's our blood, that's our inside. So you can imagine that we can deal with weather that is warm, colder because our body has natural warmth and it counteracts. But when it hits what we call the freezing point and starts dropping from there, that's when it starts overwhelming your own internal heating system, so to speak. And without coverings, you can experience frost and frostbite, God forbid, and worse. So if you do have coverings, so you maintain a certain inner warmth. It's like, you know, heating, your home heating system is, kicks in. But this also is all relative. It gets too cold and you stay out too long. So cold basically is essentially goes against our natural internal warmth. And we need warmth. 96 is not a, cold, is not a, is a pretty high. 96 is not very comfortable when... Outside is 96 degrees. But internally, your body needs 96 degree warmth. Obviously, higher than that is what we call fever. Lower than that is also extremely dangerous if your body heat gets lower than that. So but we have that equilibrium. is close to 100, basically, but it's 96. So what is cold weather, if you think of it that way? It's an imbalance. It's something that is, so to speak, cooling and over, overcooling the natural heat that we have in our lives. That's on a very basic level. I'm mean, not going to discuss, of course, what the deeper meaning of that is. But I want to elaborate a bit more about this. We all know that without a sun, without sunlight, and without the heat of the sun, exactly as it is right now, we would not survive. If the sun, they say, was 100 miles further from where it is now, even though it's so far away, we would ultimately freeze. This earth would freeze. If it was 100 miles closer, it would, it would, uh, we would burn up in certain seasons. The where it is right now is perfect balance. Now, obviously, there are parts of the world, the equator, or parts of the world that are, are throughout the year, 
pretty warm. There are parts of the world that are very cold, North Pole, South Pole, Antarctica, and so on. But overall, Earth is habitable because the sun is the perfect balance. And even the seasons change, it doesn't change to that extreme. Now, obviously, again, there are regions in the world you do not want to be there in the extreme heat or extreme cold. But there are most of Earth where people live, civilization, is a place that has a balance. Too much heat is killer. Too little heat is also a killer. So really, it's all about balance. Just like we'd say, if someone said to you, is fire a good thing? You know, we know fire devast can, can devastate, can destroy, and has destroyed. On the other hand, if we eliminated fire, we would not survive either. So you need everything controlled and balanced. So essentially, when you think of cold and heat, you're really talking about balance, the proper balance. No one's talking about complete frost, and no one's talking about complete heat. You need a balance. And actually, the winter plays a very critical role in life and survival. It is part of the cycle. As vegetation and the trees go to sleep, so to speak, in hibernation through the winter. They rejuvenate themselves like asleep, and they regenerate. And then when they blossom in the spring, and then, and, and then flourish in the, in the summer, it's like a rebirth, and you need that. So you need these cycles. So even winter has its role. But again, we're talking balance, everything balanced. As far as the person goes, a person, a person goes, we are, people are in need of warmth. Now, now I mean warmth, I don't just mean physical warmth. I'm talking about personal warmth. What would a human being like if we didn't have warmth? If we did not have love and the nurturing and what we call the warmth that you grow up in the hearth, the warmth of your home, the warmth of people that love you and that are kind to you. And it's interesting, we call it warmth. Is it physical warmth? Sometimes it's even physical warmth because when you're cold physically and someone embraces you and hugs you, in a sense they're warming you up. When you're cold, at heart, your heart is cold, or you feel indifferent or, uh, or, uh, or uh, complacent, you know, we say, I'm people say, I'm cold, cold-hearted. You know, when you say, I'm cold to something, meaning I'm indifferent, so warmth is what makes us reconnect. Passion, passion, and love is connected, is always associated with warmth. So when you think of warmth, you have to think of it not just in terms of pure physical, like I said, the whole point, exercise here, the whole point is to move beyond just warmth as in terms of temperature and barometer and, 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 uh, and a weather, a weather um, report. But warmth in the sense of what, what, what means living a warm life. So there are people in the dead, in the dead, of, the dead heat of the summer are cold-hearted bastards, pardon the expression. And there are people in the deep freeze of the winter are the warmest type of people. So it's not really based on the weather, based on what you exude and what type of human being you are. <clears throat> you know, we'd like to believe, I'm sure most of us would like to believe that when people see you, meet you, they feel warmth. They feel warm at heart. It's not nice, to, it wouldn't be pleasant to hear that people tell you every time I meet you, I feel my heart uh, freezes. You know, that, that I feel all, you know, I still get all chilled. Now, most people will not tell you that. They're not going to tell you. By the way, you know, every time I see you, you know, I just, you're not going to really hear it. But it would be a great virtue if you could feel that when people meet with you and people see you, they feel uplifted. They feel warm, heart warmed. Their, warm is, their heart is warmed. So warmth is, in many ways, even more than the warmth of the physical world, is the warmth is the key to really a healthy life. And you know, always you want to appreciate something, you have to think of it when you, uh, you have to think of the other extreme. Let's say you were deprived of it. We don't really appreciate the water we drink or the other things that we do that are healthy until suddenly, God forbid, you're deprived, you suddenly realize how important it is. So what would a, a human being like when there's no warmth? What would it be like growing up in a home that was cold and dead? I mean, dead in the emotional sense of the word. And people did not care about each other. And the child was not felt nurtured. Did not feel that they have the warmth of the, and the love of their parents. I don't think I have to elaborate what kind of devastating effect that has. Because it's necessary. Just like a flower needs water, a human being needs warmth. And if you don't have warmth, it affects you. First, the deprivation itself can cause you to wither and feel extremely um, unworthy and to the point where you start seeing yourself as not worthy enough for love. And then 
you start looking for ways to compensate, and they often are un un unhealthy ways. That's what we do. When, you're, when you are desperate for something, you look for whatever will, whatever will take to fill the void, to numb the pain, which is really the essence of all, almost all addictions and all vices that we fall into. Then it's not because anybody wants to say, you know, I want to become a destructive person. I want to self-destruct. No one makes such pronouncements, I'm going to self-destruct. What they do is you're looking for some relief or some love or some warmth. And sometimes if you don't find it, like just like someone in the desert is, is desperate for a drink, they'll drink anything. And they may end up drinking something toxic and destructive. So the same thing is here. So if you think of it that way, then the cold and warmth, obviously, are two poles, two uh, counter forces. And the cold, imagine the cold in that sense, is that's why the cold is such a, uh, a negative experience. I'm talking about, again, not balanced cold. I'm not talking about a cooling agent or a cooling force that keeps the heat at bay that we all need. You know, just like you need a fan in your computer because it gets overheated. And even in our own systems, our breathing is almost like a um, wind system that keeps, that cools the, the intensity of the blood rushing and the heart's pumping and so on. So we all need cooling elements. But we're talking about when it gets to a point of over, where it's the freezing point. And the freezing point in the psychological context is what we would call the indifference, or even worse, a cold heart, someone that doesn't care, and someone that um, exudes a, uh, a, uh, a coldness. And the Torah talks about this coldness in the terms of Amalek, the arch enemy of the people, of the Jewish people, is associated with Kririt in Hebrew, called like ice, Kerach. And there's what does that mean? You get all excited about something. You're exuberant. You come and say, wow, I'm really, I'm really enthusiastic. And someone throws cold water on it. That's the expression we use. What does that mean? Don't get so excited. You're, you're overdoing uh, it. You know, the cynical voice that says, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Don't think you can ever get out of your traps. It's one of the worst things to hear, you know, when you get excited about something and then someone friendly or someone you trust or respect just dismisses the whole thing. Because, like, you lose your confidence. That's an example of a coldness, throwing cold, cold water on, on something that you're excited about. You know, when children come home from school, I was just, uh, me, I met a, uh, a couple that were having a lot of difficulties. And I was talking to one of them about their childhood. And, uh, and she told me that her one of her, I said, give me some memory that you have when you were a child, any memory, positive or negative. And I just wanted to see what would come knee jerk, like a spontaneous reaction. And she said, I remember coming home when I was maybe seven, eight years old. I was so excited. I did some type of project in school. Um, you know, if I look at it now, it's a child, you know, childish little thing. But I came home, my father started laughing at me as if like, you know, dismissed the whole thing. And it was so devastating because like, you know, I was so excited about it and I couldn't wait to come home and show it to my parents. This was her memory. Now, if you think about it in terms of context, you'd say, big thing, it's okay, so you laugh. No, but for a child, it, it, it can destroy because the child doesn't yet understand what, it, for the child, that was an accomplishment. And even if the father did feel that way, since when do you have to laugh at your child? You go along, any healthy parent, what do you do? Your child's excited, you get excited with them. You don't start saying, you know what, on my terms, and I'm a multi-billionaire, this is meaningless, because if you, if you made a lot of money today, that would be a big, significant event. Of course you don't do that. But this shaped her. And this was not once. This was her, the life she grew up with. I can't say it was every day, but she grew up with this type of... And, and for her, the, her work is going to find out and, and be that her father was simply an insecure little baby. And he couldn't have the, the humility and, the, and the, the sense, the, the love, to just celebrate with someone that's celebrating. It was all about him. So she will have to learn that and learn that it was not about her, it was about him. But this is an example where a cold and different, a uh, dispassionate attitude can really be devastating. And even for adults too. Someone you care about and loves you and they 
come to you or you come to them with something exciting and they, you know, they make with their nose and they just dismiss it. It's not, you know, even, if, even if it's true that maybe it's not such a big thing, sometimes you have to just let people, let them feel a little good. And I mean, I'm not talking about if it's something destructive and you want to uh, warn them. And even then has to be done. You have, we have to validate each other because that's what souls need. Coldness is the invalidation and basically the demoralization of the dignity of a soul. And, with, I mean, and I'm, of course, I'm talking about, extreme, again, I'm talking about the extreme cold. So when you think of it that way, coldness is, another word for it would be detachment, where warmth would be attachment and cold would be detachment. So now let's go a little deeper into the, I said, the subatomic, into the mystical. So the question that Kabbalists ask, where does this coldness come from? Since everything comes from a higher divine place, and everything is connected to its source, so why, why would there be room for this type of detachment? You know, to put, put it in a different context, where is there room for it? If we are all, and this is even basic physics, that even though the world is filled with a multitude of diverse creatures and diverse forces and systems, yet we know there's an integral unity that connects everything. And the unity is so profound that we have yet even to fathom its extent. You know, we're just beginning to pick it up. Think of the ecosystem. Things could be an imbalance thousands of miles away in the algae of some sea that's not being consumed in the right measure, and it can destroy the whole food chain all the way to everywhere in the world. That's how the interconnection. And when I even, we're talking about even millions of miles away. So there's an integral unity, which frankly is not that surprising. If you think about it, let's look at yourself in the mirror. I don't mean the physical self. I mean, think of yourself. What's going on inside your little frame that's at five or six feet tall and just, let's say, 100, 150 pounds? I always we stop by 150 for obvious reasons. Um, what's going on in this little, little human being, relatively you have millions. You, have, you, know, you, know, you, know how many, you know how many cells a human being has? Anybody has a guess? Any guess? You know, may know it because I said it here at the class. Let's test the, the people who watch my classes live. This is a test, a quiz. Anyway, it's a 75 trillion cells, trillion, not billion, trillion cells. I know it's almost impossible to imagine. As I always say, it's the only thing larger than the U.S. deficit. Um, trillion, not billion, trillion. You know, you start thinking how, where they all fit. How could they all fit inside? So then you realize cells are a little, uh, they're pretty small. <laughs> you know, let me ask you, how many ideas do you think can fit in your brain? A thousand? Ten thousand? A million? A billion? Who knows, right? No one's ever tested it. We've never run out of hard drive. You never run out of memory. So it's, it's interesting. It just goes to show you again how little we know about space and time and the forces that make us tick. My point I'm making is there's trillions of cells and million, billion, uh, thousands of systems and they work in a healthy person miraculously like a conductor of a symphony, perfect. Obviously, disease, infection, God forbid, illness upsets the balance, but look how much of the balance there is. It's like amazing. And we take it completely for granted. If you just knew how many mechanisms had to be in place to get one breath into your mouth and turn it to oxygen and then to blood, it's a bit mind-blowing. The method, what about the mechanisms when you take a piece of food in your mouth and how it breaks down and the digestive system? And how it, I mean, all happening without any uh, um, uh, so-called supervisor. Like there's nobody at each gate saying, okay, you know, this goes here. But maybe there is someone, not someone, something. So there's an integral unity. So the Kabbalists and the mystics and even the Talmud asks a very big question. If all of us are interconnected, how is it that we can hurt each other? For example, in the animal kingdom, there are predator and prey. But if you know, the predator and prey are all necessary. If the predators did not do what they did and the prey did not, were not prey, we would have a complete imbalance. So even though it's sad to see uh, a vulnerable deer be, uh, be, be killed by a, a predator, a tiger, a lion, whatever, 
But that's the balance. And interestingly, another interesting thing, the more anim- the more a item is consumed on Earth, the more it multiplies. Did you ever know that? There are, there are much more vegetables in this world than there are animals because they're consumed more. If they were not consumed with animals, they would, they, would, they would overtake the world. And they destroy the world. And there are more, let's watch less predators than there are prey. So there's a balance. I remember a few years ago reading in, uh, what is it? Um, what park? Uh, 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 the Yellowstone. Yellowstone Park. So there was suddenly, what happened? Oh, the, the wolves were going extinct. So suddenly there was a, a barrage of elk that literally were going to destroy the whole park because they were eating everything and there were so many of them because the wolves kept their population at bay. Just as an example. But when it comes to human beings, we actually can hurt each other for no reason. To say that war or injustice is part of the balance is actually not right. This is human choices. So how, the question is, how is it that we can hurt each other for all part of one integral unity? Or to put it in the context of our, uh, the weather discussion here, how can we be cold to each other when it's such a vital component to be connected with each other? So we, essentially we can be cold and detached from something that is giving us life. And you see this from parents to children and children to parents, siblings, and of course strangers. So the answer is, the mystical answer comes down to the great Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, who in the 16th century in Tzfat taught what's called the secret doctrine, Soda Tzimtzum, the secret of the Tzimtzum. You may have heard this expression, I've talked about it many times, but what is it? A type of paradigm shift that concealed this integral unity from us to see. If we knew, if I knew it, you knew, that you and I are dependent on each other, would it be possible for, I'm going to hurt a part, a life, or something that sus- sustains me? And the Talmud uses a very simple example for it. If you're one organism, one body, is it conceivable that the right hand would, would injure the right left hand because whatever it doesn't agree with it? No, because it knows it's one body. And if you injure the left hand, you're injuring yourself. So how is it possible? Because we don't sense that we're one organism. And why don't we sense it? Because there was a divine concealment. You want to say that the first big chill is the symptom. It chilled existence. When everything was once, or not when I say once, I mean conceptually, conceptually once, in a certain dimension, everything is integrally connected. There came a chilling, freezing winter called the symptom and made us feel disconnected and detached. And that's the original root in Kabbalistic language of extreme cold. So when you go outside in the street now, tonight it's a little, I think not as cold as it was, I guess, before the snow. But uh, remember yesterday morning or two days ago, pretty good, pretty intense. I go out in the morning just to get a good fresh breath of air. And you know when your lungs start about to freeze, you know that it's time to close the door. So, but... You go outside, and if you think of it that way, you almost get like a, uh, I think it could even har- warm your heart to know this chill coming from the Arctic is really coming from the symptom, and it's part of the dynamics of existence. We'll soon get to how we deal with it, but understanding that everything in this world, even a thing like pure cold weather, has a, has a source, a root. And by understanding the root, you can learn how to counter this coldness. Because as we always talk about this, I always talk about this, this healing things on this, by the symptoms or healing it at the root. As you all know, there's two types of medicine. There's a rem- remedial medicine, which is a remedy. You have a headache, take a, a, a Tylenol, take a Advil, a Band-Aid. But then there is preventive medicine, or we'll call it um, not, not treating the symptoms but treating the root. Now this is even a physical medicine, and definitely psychic or psychological medicine, which means when you really want to get to solve a problem, so some problems are superficial, fine. You can quickly fix it by all means. But if a problem is persisting, 
let's say in a marriage, spouses continuously butt heads and they can't come to terms. Or other relationships, you re- then you realize at some point it's not just a band-aid that's going to work. You need to get to the root of what's going on. And that's not always easy because the root can be invisible. People may not even be conscious of it. Like I said, it's in the super conscious. And even if you are conscious, we usually don't like to go there. It's very uncomfortable because it's much easier to just look at the surface instead of dealing with the deeper source, root of things. But at some point, you come to realize that if you don't re- correct it there, you'll continuously suffer the symptoms. And you solve one little, you put out one fire, another fire will ignite. You just will never end because not only won't end, it'll get worse. So getting to the root of something, even though you may have not solved it yet, is the first step in all healing, especially in psychological and emotional healing. <clears throat> getting to the root, it's like what's called Yediyat tamachla Chetzer Awareness of the problem is half the cure. And in truth, I can say without hesitation that in every situation I've ever been, the biggest challenge is finding out the root, not the healing. You're, once you find the root, you're already halfway there. It's still work. I'm not saying it's automatic. But the challenge is to find what is the real question, not what the answer is. What is the real question here that has to be asked? Because most people never say what the problem the, the problems we express are usually not the real problem. Again, I'm not talking about superficial things. I'm talking about serious things. So understanding the root of coldness and detachment, you know, why should a person be detached from another person? So the textbook reason, and again, I don't want to be generic and uh, there's no cookie cutter model, but one of the classic textbook reasons, a person who's detached was usually because they're afraid of attachment. They're afraid because either they've been hurt when they were attached, they've been hurt either as children, so they're afraid to commit to things. They're afraid to get close to anything. You'll hear this very often. I'm afraid to get too close to someone because then I get vulnerable and I'll be hurt, hurt again. In other words, of course everybody wants warmth and, and attachment, but I'm afraid. Now, fear doesn't always mean they're trembling. It could be a very quiet, silent fear, but it's there. That's one very base, obvious, one, obvious. That's one of the main reasons. There's other reasons as well. Just to give an extreme of this reason is, you often see this, sadly, that often children who are babies, newborn babies that are separated from their mother very early on, they call separation anxiety, will have real problems with attachment and detachment because it's vital and necessary and increasingly understood today by psychologists, the importance of the bonding, in the early stages. I think they even give it the first, um, I don't even know amount of time, but a certain period of time that's absolutely vital. I mean, in different, in different uh, species of animals, you have different types of bonding. There are animals, actually, once a child uh, is born, the, the, the mother leaves and never sees them again. But good, God, God bless those animals with different tools, and they're able to manage. But, for example, sea otters, sea otters, I study sea otters. No, I'm not an expert on sea otters, but I, get, I, I love this natural stuff. I think there's always lessons. Sea otters... Um, mother otters will touch their children, their new offspring. I, I remember the number of times, maybe uh, 60 times a minute or something. Just touch. They swim and they just keep touching. And, you know, it's been observed and they realize it's a way of building security of the child, of the newborn, just to know that someone's there. We're not talking about because the, 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 the newborn is in distress or hungry or tired or, or whatever or in pain. It's just a way of connection. Look, the fact of the matter is, I find this fascinating, and the Kabbalists talk about this a lot. Well, a lot, uh, I mean, a, a lot in quantity, in quality, that the nine months that we're in our mother's womb is the ultimate attachment. Completely submerged in embryonic fluids, literally like underwater, completely protected, and the ultimate warmth. The perfect environment. It cannot be more perfect. And even, God forbid, when a child has to be born prematurely, what do they do? They create an incubator that copies the womb. Not the womb copies the incubator. The exact warmth, the perfect temperature, and the environment to be able to re- re- replicate that environment. Warmth. So when there's any form of coldness, and what I call detachment early age, it has usually, usually devastating effects. Again, it could all be countered. There's no such thing as damaged goods and doomed, but you have to get to the root of things.
And there are many other examples of, of cold attitudes. And interestingly, in, in Jewish thought, in Jewish law, there's a, I always, I'm very, it's very moving to me whenever I think about it. It says if you're in the middle of prayer, you're praying to God, and someone comes over to you, a stranger, and greets you. They either they don't notice you're praying, or even if they do notice. So except for a few exceptions, depending which prayer, but most of the prayer you're supposed to stop praying and say hello to them. Because it's considered a disrespect to God and to a human being created in the divine image to ignore a human being. That's how the extent of sensitivity of not to be show coldness to somebody. Why? Because every human being is worthy of respect. And it makes no difference who it is. Even if they understand, there's a certain element of that. You know, we live in a world where you can sit in a stadium with 60,000 people. What do we have in Brazil? The stadiums of 120,000 people, I think, right? When they play we, the... We, huh? Yeah, right. Now, now it's only up to 60. Okay. We start up to 200,000. Right. Why they, why they lower it? They, for security? security? Oh. But it doesn't matter. You sit with 60,000 people. That's a lot of people. Everybody's cheering. And you think it's a brotherhood of mankind. You think it's like world peace. It's messianic. And then when the party's over and you ask somebody, can you do me a favor? They don't even want to look at you. It's called fake unity. Yeah, it's, it's nice, but it's false. It's not based on truth. It's based on uh, you know, an entertaining moment. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, at least they have that. But we can live in a world where we're completely cold to each other and we have these moments of, uh, I guess, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, manufactured unity. You know. But the point is that coldness is essentially a criminal thing to be cold to a person because it is giving into that symptom that covered all up. Okay, so then how do we... Uh, get to the root of it, and how do we correct it at the root? The answer is pretty obvious. Well, it's obvious and not so obvious. What's not obvious is the question is, why would God create such a chill? Why did he create a situation where you can have such freezing cold? Why not make it that, you know, the weather can only go to this, like, for example, it's never going to become 200 degrees below zero, or even 100 degrees in a region like this. If that would happen, it would be, you know, complete something, something wrong. So why didn't you just make it that it never gets colder than 30 degrees, let's say, Fahrenheit? Uh, and in psychological terms, why did he allow such a chill to be existent that we can forget and not recognize our integral unity and our connection with each other? And the answer, of course, is that um, for us to be an independent entity and not influenced and shaped by God's choice, but we make our choices, there has to be that risk. You have to create a world that's capable of being cold to each other and being wise enough not to choose that way. Because if you create an environment where there's no concealment, so to speak, as, the, uh, as, the, uh, as, the, as the Rizal puts it, then there's no room for independence. If a child remains in its mother's womb, that's beautiful. But you will not have a functioning child making choices and the purpose of existence, as the way the, the sages put it, is to enter a cold and hostile world like ours and turn it into a warm and nurturing environment. And that purpose cannot be realized unless there's the potential for this. Um, you can't have true love and attachment if you don't have the po possibility of the opposite. That's how it is in life. Because we're not puppets, and we weren't created just to uh, play out a script. We were created to be able to make choices. And when Moses asked God, why would you create a world where people can make, can misinterpret and make a mistake? He says, that's the world I created. Those that will make, want to make a mistake will make a mistake. In other words, God created an agnostic universe with the capacity of people denying their own creator, the capacity of people denying our connection, and the capacity of people to, determine, to decide dog eats dog, or in Richard Dawkins' terms, the selfish gene, that we are selfish, cold-hearted creatures. And the only reason we help each other is because it helps ourselves. Basically, survival of the fittest. The coldest statement ever stated, the survival of the fittest. It's not because there's really any real love between us. I'll love you because I need you. And you'll love me because need you, you need me. 
Even that's a cold state. Even the warmth is coming because of cold reasons. So those were all cold-hearted, selfish entities interested in one thing only, survival. That is the extreme opposite, obviously, of... Um, that's like the coldest approach to life. If you read a little Schopenhauer, it's like an extreme um, version of existentialism in that sense, you get a good sense of the chilling description of even love, where he says basically there is no such thing as love. Love of two human beings is just nature's trick to get two people together to breed and, give, and, and, and perpetuate the species. That's how cold-hearted it is. And the expressions you'll find from people, the cynics, who will say, nature is the coldest thing of all. Here, you can have a holocaust where innocent children, men, women, are being destroyed and the grass continues to grow and the birds continue to chirp and the sun rises and the moon rises and the sky is blue as if everything is going all right. Nature is merciless. It's indifferent. Anything colder than that. And people, you know, poets have uh, written and cried out, you know, why did the not sun not stop for one moment, at least one moment in protest that human beings are being slaughtered? And I don't just mean the Holocaust is one example. Anytime a human being is, you look at nature, where's nature? How come no one, why isn't God's nature protesting? Why isn't somebody saying something? That's the symptom in, in full, 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 full glory, basically creating a shroud that conceals the unity. And you can end up killing the thing you love most. They're using, I don't know, should I quote his name? Oscar Wilde. And why not? We're quoting Schopenhauer, you can quote Oscar Wilde. We can quote them all. You kill the thing you love most, you can kill the thing that, gives, that, is, that you need more than anything else because you don't see and recognize that it's who you are. And you can even kill yourself spiritually because you don't see. And you ask the question, how could that be? That's the only possible scenario. That risk has to be taken. If we're going to be significant, we cannot be in our mother's womb. We have to be able to, if you're going to be able to walk on your own, you have to be able to fall. And learn that, not to fall, but to walk. And whether we'll ever understand it completely, one thing is very clear. That for God to take away our free will is worse than allowing us to hurt each other. That's how important it is. And so therefore it's innate in the existence. If you want love and warmth, there's going to have to be a potential for coldness and detachment. But that's not the intention. The intention is that that chill should be understood for what it is. It's meant to create an environment for us to come to learn to warm it. I just heard a very, a very uh, president, the Israel president, Shazar. He was president of Israel in the mid-60s and early 70s. So he came to see the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, in 1970, a few times, but one was 1973. And it was Purim time. It was like uh, February time. And, and it, was, it was extremely cold, like this. And, um, and there's a recording where he's entering, and he spoke a very, very beautiful and very um, Yiddish, very rich Yiddish. So he says to the Rebbe, maybe there's people there, it's a recording, he says, I'm translating from, anybody who speaks Yiddish here? Anyway, I'm translating from Yiddish. He says, even in the coldest regions of the Holy Land, Israel, and there are cold regions in the Golan, Mount uh, Hermon, Hermon, other places, it says, even in the coldest regions, it doesn't come to the coldness of this frigid city here in New York, something like that. You know, but he said in a very like, uh, dramatic way. And the Rebbe said, looks at him and says to him, like nonchalantly, he says, and that's why we send souls everywhere to go warm up the cold. Now, I know it's a simple type of uh, expression, but really, if you know the, the deeper meaning behind it, that's exactly the right way to put it. This world on its own can be very cold and hostile. Cold weather is, doesn't come compared at all to the hostility and coldness that people can have to each other, as I said, even in the summer. But there's a reason for everything. It's not an end in itself. Because it, you could be two things. You could either be a victim of the cold and say, okay, listen, I'm going to stay inside or I'm going to bundle up or I'm going to... Just bear, you know, just wait it out. 
or just watch, watch the weather channel and see like, what's going to happen here, you know. Um, or you can take the bull by the horns and be proactive and say, oh, they're cold. It's a lesson. It's a lesson why I've sent to this world to bring warmth to the world. And that's a very different attitude. There's people who are reactive, and they react to things, and they wait for something to happen. They're observers, observant Jews. They observe others. And then there are people who, ta- who are proactive, who initiate, leaders, pioneers. So when a leader, when a follower or a conformist or someone who is uh, reactive sees something, a challenge, they retreat and they say it's someone else's problem or you know, I'll just wait it out. When someone who's a proactive person, they see a situation, right away, opportunity. That's a leader. What does this teach me? What am I supposed to do? And they find ways to build deeper, reach deeper arsenals of warmth to warm their environment and the people around them. There's also another expression that you find that tzaddik and pelts, which is when it gets cold, somebody puts on a fur coat. They take care of themselves. And another person lights a fireplace. The person with the fur coat only warms themselves. No one else gets warm. And the person who lights the fireplace warms everybody, including themselves. They tell this analogy, two guys were walking very cold, frigid night. They got lost in the woods. <clears throat> one of them was a heavier person. One of them was a slimmer. And as it got colder and colder, you can imagine the person that had more blubber had more protection. The one with less started passing out. They fell down in the snow. And his friend, who was a true friend, instead of just uh, abandoning him and going to look for help for himself, he went down on his hands and knees and began to massage, make sure he doesn't get frozen, and keep his, uh, his blood going, his blood circulating, keep him as warm as he could. And he worked hard, hard, okay. Then it's getting colder and colder, and even this heavier person is now also so it's just overwhelming him. But miraculously, someone comes and saves them both. They bring them to an inn, their fire, and they both, thank God, get revived and survive, and everything's fine. So afterwards, the slimmer man, the one that passed out first, comes over to his friend and says, you know, I must thank you because... You know, you could have easily just left me there for dead. And I definitely wouldn't have survived. And you stayed and you kept me warm. And the the heavier person said, I have to thank you. He says, why do you have to thank me? He says, because if I had not exerted myself to warm you, I would have also passed out earlier. So the mere fact that I worked and was busy trying to keep you going was keeping me going. This is a classic example of what a uh, proactive person does. They don't, I mean, another joke that counters this story is the classic one, these two guys go camping and uh, and it's not a cold night. They go camping and in the middle of the night, one wakes up and he hears a bear. There's a bear scouring around looking for food and bears are dangerous. So he wakes up his friend, he says, we got to get out of here, there's a bear. And his friend says, okay, okay. So he starts tying his sneakers the friend that woke him up starts tying his, he's tying his sneakers. He was putting on his He says, what do you think, you can outrun the bear? He says, no, all I have to do is outrun you. You know? That's the opposite. Where, you know, survival of the fittest. Taking care of yourself. So we always have these two options. You know, hopefully we should never be tested. But this is the world in which we live where it can be a very hostile, cold, indifferent, and... Uh, and uh, the word complacent world. And you see it, and sometimes you grow up, at some point in life people tell you, start, don't be so naive, take care of yourself because no one else is going to care about you. And it's true, many people don't really care about anyone but themselves. And push comes to shove, that's all that matters to them. So what's the attitude? You can say, okay, you know, I'll throw in the towel, and now since everybody's like that, I also become like that. Well, I would submit, that's why, thank God, as the Jewish people are here today, 4,000 years since Abraham, because he did not make that choice. He said, you know what? The whole world can go that direction. I, for one, will not. It doesn't matter how many people do it. I will not do that. And thank God there have been people in history, I'm not saying the majority, but enough, that did not bow to Haman, and they did not bow to the conformists, 
and they did not bow to the status quo. And they said, I mean, Steve Jobs, they, they attribute it to him, where they say only those that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. I think he stole that straight from the Jews. But regardless, not suing for plagiarism. But uh, by, you know, God bless everyone. They can embrace that idea. Great. But that's what leaders do. They, are, they understand this world. And the root of it is a cold place. But the cold is not its natural. That's what God imposed. He imposed a big chill to conceal the connections and the attachments that we have and the warmth as well with only one goal, for us to not be deceived by the cold and realize there's a deeper warmth that's stronger than any cold. And that we have the power to elicit that, to uh, generate that type of warmth. And that when we come to a cold and hostile place or we meet cold and hostile people, we can bring warmth there. Now, obviously, you have to choose your battles. Some people, you know, maybe you don't have to always hang around with the coldest people on earth. But it means that wherever you go, you can always bring a little more warmth and illumination. So it's a very basic question. Everyone here and everyone listening and everyone out there is going to be somewhere tomorrow, tonight. Think of it this way. When you come to a place and you leave that place, have you made it warmer and more bright or not? It's a very black and white question. It's a yes or no. And, you know, I know you could say, I, I left it the way it was. Okay, so there's no change. So nothing was accomplished. Or you made it brighter or warmer. Or, God forbid, you made it colder and darker, which I hope that's not the case. But that's the way a healthy person thinks. And that's the way a mission-driven person thinks. You think in terms, am I, my soul is made of fire. Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam. We're coming from Hanukkah now, a few weeks ago. It's all about flames. What does that flame does? It uh, lights, illuminates the dark, and warms the cold. That's exactly what it does. And the soul is called a flame. That's exactly what the soul is called. And Torah mitzvah is called ner mitzvah v'torah, the flame of the mitzvah and the light of Torah. And if you look, you'll see light and flames are a central theme, even more than you can imagine. In all of the Torah, you have the menorah in the temple, you have the lighting of the Friday night candles and the holiday and the Hanukkah. And then even, God forbid, when someone passes away, you light a flame. Because flames represent the soul, the soul that came to this cold world to bring warmth to every corner of the earth. You know, I, I suggested this a number of times. I'm going to say it again. There was, um, who was it that told me? Uh, someone shared with me that they were at a birthday party. And there was a little girl's birthday. She's uh, six, seven years old. They brought a birthday cake, and as the custom of the land goes, the seven candles... And they all said to the little girl, now blow out the candles. And her response was classic response. She says, we don't blow out candles, we light candles. Because that's what we do. We light candles. Blowing out a candle is actually similar like blowing out life or blowing out warmth and light. So I was thinking to myself, maybe this can go viral, I don't know, to start making a new custom. Instead of lighting candles, why don't we leave the candles unlit and let the birthday girl light seven candles instead of blowing out seven candles. Anyway, maybe it'll catch, maybe it won't. But so these little things actually are significant messages because it's a whole different way of looking at it. I'm not even sure where this girl got that from, but she, I guess she lit candles on Friday. So she wasn't, doesn't want to burn out, blow out candles. We want to light candles. You agree? You second the motion? <coughs> okay, good. For the record, Keith seconds the motion. Resolved. Good. Um, if this was a board meeting for the world's... Uh, point of interest. Huh? So my friends, I hope that some of these words warm your heart and um, touch your souls. And above all, that next time you go out to the cold, even tonight, you take another look at it. You know, spend an extra second thinking about it and look at like what's the DNA, what dynamics behind all of this. Like why is it cold? And why am I uncomfortable? And maybe that can be a catalyst that says, okay, I'm here to do something about it. To warm myself, and of course, to warm others. And when you warm others, as I said, it warms you as well. So maybe that's a nice way of putting it also, that the Meaningful Life Center is driven by this mission. And I'm very touched by your uh, being here. Every time meeting somebody, people who have watched me, you know me, I don't know you, 
it's a one way. So uh, I see your smile like you know me well, but I feel um, reciprocal warmth, okay? And um, enjoy your stay here and uh, bring back warmth to, well, it's warm there, but bring back spiritual warmth to uh, the Brazilian world. And everyone out there, please stay in touch. And I mean that literally in the sense of connections is the antidote to disconnections, just like attachment is the counterforce to detachment. And may we all, uh, are all, every one of us contributing our little warmth, add up to some collective cosmic warmth that warms this planet, global warming in the, the healthy spiritual sense of the word, but not too warm. As I said, even warmth has to be balanced, the perfect balance of hot and cold. Like, you know, like a good ice cream sundae where it's perfectly cold, and you got the hot chocolate syrup. Makes you hungry? Always. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I haven't had that in I don't know how long. Um, but, uh, but, you know, <laughs> hot and cold all together. So everyone be blessed. Have a very warm and illuminating week. And enjoy the spiritual messages that come to us in all directions, sometimes through the heat, sometimes through the cold, sometimes through the snow, sometimes through the rain, sometimes through the winds. Listen to the winds. They have many messages for us. Thank you very much. Thank you.